Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, on this uh, symposium uh, concerning the activities that the Association of the, for the Improvement of Mental Health Programs, which I'm uh, currently leading, uh, has undertaken in responding to major problems of psychiatry as we see them in the year 2021. I think that uh, while uh, psychiatry is an important field, it is uh, certainly also very important to remember at this point the variety of other major trends in society which uh, influence the psychiatry and influence the way in which it is practiced and the success which it might have. And I've written here <clears throat> some of the global trends which I think affect psychiatry in a significant manner in these, uh, in our years now. The first of those is the word commoditification. It's a word that has been invented, I think, by the World Bank. And it basically uh, expresses the notion that uh, everything should be measured as if it was a commodity. So uh, it's sugar or iron or ore of other types. And so everything has to be expressed in, 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 in this way. So that when the Lancet uh, um, document on global mental health was uh, uh, produced, one of the chief arguments was that the medications are not expensive. And uh, when we speak about hospitals, uh, the hospitals are good hospitals if they make profit, etc. And it is uh, the permanent uh, conversion of various values uh, into, into monetary value. So that in many ways, the ethical imperative to be helpful to people or not well is gradually turning into an economic opportunity. And that is something that is very important and certainly in the field of psychiatry plays a major role. Another phenomenon that is of importance is the urbanization. Because of its variety of effects which it has on human relations and on grouping of humans and them surviving in towns, uh, a country like Argentina now has about 95% of the population living in towns. And uh, the people who have arrived there, have been arrived there in the last 20 or 30 years, they don't know each other. They are not a community anymore in the sense as we were originally thinking a community, geographically defined, uh, sharing uh, certain problems, but also sharing answers uh, to these problems, knowing each other, etc. Now, the fact that this has happened has also had a mighty influence on psychiatry, because the anomie, the namelessness of the people in a town is a very different proposition uh, from what we were saying and preaching how important it would be to develop in the sense of a community psychiatry, which, of course, in this sense, has to be adjusted, changed uh, in many ways. Another phenomenon that is also present is the fragmentation of professions into ever smaller parts. And I think that's understandable because knowledge has grown enormously, and also because a top-level specialist in a very na narrow field usually can charge much more for his services than if he is a generalist. And I think that the fragmentation of professions has led to the fact that we now, have, even in our own field, a specialist in early interventions, a specialist in manic depressive illness, etc., uh, specialities which make it very difficult to provide comprehensive care to the to the person. So that in some places people have to invent additional stuff which will make sure that the person who is will not well, in fact, can get all the services uh, that he needs to get in this very complex uh, forest of uh, complete or very uh, different uh, uh, disciplines that, in fact, should be uh, linked, but are not. The, another phenomenon that is more recent is what has been called the horizontalization of communication, in which people more and more communicate with those who are at the same uh, level of age, same level of discipline, same discipline, etc. cetera. Uh, not so much in a vertical sense. And of course, that deprives the young from any uh, influence of the elderly and uh, old, and um, the experience which has been gained is not used properly, and all sorts of nonsense ideas can be born in the horizontal layers uh, and are not corrected by the fact that they are, in fact, mainly happening in the stream of people who are very similar to one another. Changing roles of women is tremendously important change that has also hit the world now. Uh, we know that women have in the past uh, carried uh, uh, so many roles. They had been 
looking after the sick and uh, uh, bringing up children and transmitting culture and many other functions. Now, many of them have now, particularly in the last 15, 20 years, gone to work outside of the house. But nobody has in the meanwhile gone and done the work which they were doing before. So many of them are under tremendous stress and uh, with enormous number of things that they have to do. And of course, while they are exhausted at the same time, the functions, the various functions which they have, nobody else does. And also uh, the result of it, of course, is that it's less done, less done, less well. And we have problems in many of the fields that, uh, that have been previously so ably covered by women. So I think, I hope that the years to come or very soon, uh, somebody will finally decide to provide sufficient help uh, to cover these other functions as well, so as to have the various roles of women, uh, in fact, uh, bringing the fruit as we would have liked to see. The demographic change, of course, is also an important thing with a growing number of elderly and the diminishing number of children, the growth of number of siblingless children who have only uh, uh, friends and not very many friends either, and who grow up in a uh, very different way from what we were growing up when we were small. And then there is the digitalization, a phenomenon, a trend of turning so many things into a digital form. It's wonderful. It brings many benefits. It has helped us a great deal uh, to, uh, for example, uh, link records or to get information quickly or inform the world. But it has also, in many ways, dehumanized relationships between people. And uh, I think the two-dimensional communication is very nice because for transmitting information, but it doesn't transmit empathy. It doesn't transmit what normally happens in a uh, relationship between people when they are together uh, in a what we call presential way. Now, uh, the tasks of psychiatry in this curious world are uh, usually being to treat mental disorders, to do research on the origins of uh, mental disorders and the development, to educate various categories of personnel and to, uh, these tasks will undoubtedly remain with psychiatry, uh, although it can share it. Some of them, for example, treatment of mental disorders can be shared by, um, with the general practitioners or with other categories of health workers. But uh, nevertheless, uh, a very central role in the um, treatment of in the, in the process of treatment of mental disorders will remain on the psychiatrist's shore of tasks. But there are new tasks. The first of those, which I think is of tremendous importance, is that we rediscover the prim primary prevention of mental disorders. We have some time ago written a paper for the World Health Assembly in which we have demonstrated that about 50% of all mental and neurological pro uh, problems are amenable to primary prevention. Not secondary prevention, primary prevention. A gross example of that is the provision of iodine to women who are in uh, childbearing age and who, if they have not sufficient iodine, will give birth to children who are cretins. How many? Well, four to six million today in the world. It's a perfectly preventable condition. We can absolutely eliminate it if we uh, are sure that we can provide the iodine supplementation to women. And I could go on listing a number of other things around perinatal care, about preventing school dropouts, about uh, correcting sensory deficit, for example, uh, mild, the same, mild problems of hearing, which uh, separate the child from other children, make it fail in school and make it get the, the um, designation of being disobedient, etc., etc. There is a huge number of problems that can be resolved by primary prevention. The second problem I think that we have to address very clearly is the pandemic of comorbidity of mental and physical disorders. More and more people suffer from more than one disease. And it is very rare to find a person who has been sick from a, for example, from a manic depressive illness and has no other physical illness. And yet the solution to how to deal with these various illnesses is not yet found. There are some noble examples of collaborative care in which people have found a way to work together between an internist, general practitioner, psychiatrist, etc. But these are rarities. There are usually consequences of an accident that people who went to school together 
suddenly work together in the same area and help one another. Very rarely is the comorbidity addressed properly. And it is killing because we know that people with severe mental disorders will die 10 to 15 years younger than other people who do not have mental disorders. And they don't die from the mental disorder. They die from physical illness, which is not appropriately handled. And I think it's a tremendously big problem that we have to address much more seriously than we do now. And the third, uh, I think, problem that is certainly, m we have to realize that it is more important than we previously thought, and this is to reduce the stigma of mental illness, which is coloring, coloring everything that touches mental illness. It colors doctors who deal with mental illness, hospitals which deal with mental illness, uh, medications which are used, everything that you can imagine is still uh, covered by this, or linked to the stigma, and that stigma is a significant obstacle, and we have to start thinking about what to do about it a little bit more. And finally, we have to think of reducing uh, the, some of the information which we are giving during training and revising the education, both undergraduate, postgraduate, in medicine in general, and in psychiatry in particular, uh, and combining the two to create people who will be able to deal with the problems I mentioned. Let me now uh, say a few words about the uh, Association of, for the Improvement of Mental Health Programs, which I'm leading, and which found itself, it cannot do everything. So it decided that it would deal with three uh, of these uh, new problems, more uh, than uh, with some of the problems with which we have been dealing before. So the first one is finding ways of coping with comorbidity of mental and physical disorders, dealing with the stigma, and revising training. Now, what have we done in the uh, dealing with comorbidity? We first produced a series of publications, uh, eight books, which have each covered the, an aspect. There is a depression and cancer, depression and uh, diabetes, depression and cardiovascular illness, uh, mental disorder, mental disorders over the old age, and uh, comorbid comorbidity in general, etc. A whole range of books that have been published in several languages and uh, a number of papers. And then we wanted to do a study which would, uh, in fact, allow us to, so to say, enter through the back door to open uh, the uh, action of psychiatry. And we've done an international study on diabetes and depression in some 14 countries. And this uh, has been a study in which we have examined people who come to diabetic clinics to see whether they also have some signs of depressive illness. And we have discovered, not to our surprise so much, that depression is twice as frequent to people with diabetes uh, and then in the population without diabetes. And what was more, that between 3 and 5% of those who come to the diabetic clinic and have a depression, 3 to 5% are diagnosed as having a depression. And the rest is not diagnosed as having a depression. And has, as a consequence, a whole variety of problems with diabetes, more complications of diabetes, less uh, well-controlled uh, blood sugar, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And the notion of, uh, we wanted to use this as an example, and we are using it as an example of the necessity to consider ways in which care can be provided both to the physical illness and to the mental disorders, which are very often present, and somehow shove them aside, uh, both because the uh, uh, general practitioner or uh, specialist doesn't want to deal with it, and because patients do not want to bother the doctor with their presence of symptoms which are not what the patient thinks, symptoms that belong to the diabetology. And then uh, the third thing which we've done, we've also entered into the World Psychiatric Association and created a special section, scientific section of comorbidity, which is now taking on and will continue to bring together experts, uh, regularly uh, attend uh, congresses and present symposia and um, panels, a congress which will take place in a few days in uh, uh, the world the virtual um, world congress of psychiatry will have several events that deal with comorbidity of mental disorders and we hope that the section will continue bringing people uh, bringing the notion of this importance to people the stigma was the second thing which i mentioned we have been trying to address and uh, we have created this by started this while i was president of the world psychiatric association by an international program in which we have bring, um, bring, brought people from highly developed countries and from very poor countries together to have an international program. It was called Open the Doors. And the program has uh, 
demonstrated A, that it's possible to reduce stigma significantly, and B, that it can be done even in very poor countries. And it has been a wonderful development in recent years because a number of programs have sprung up where we have started these uh, activities. And I think it has been also possible to provide in various languages a number of documents and various other uh, information that people needed. We've also created a stigma section in the World Psychiatric Association and then uh, tried to create, to forge together, to bring together all the international programs uh, that deal with stigma into a uh, global alliance against stigma, which is meeting regularly uh, and uh, which has also uh, in, um, um, exchanged their experience and uh, worked together. These are programs in Canada, a wonderful program, Open the Minds, uh, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Sweden, in uh, Denmark, uh, in Holland, in a number of countries. Uh, and I think it's very important that they are together and work together. Every two years, these associations, as well as other people, come together into a biennial international congress against stigma. The next one now was supposed to take place in Prague. We are not quite sure where it will be uh, virtual, probably it will be virtual, and then it will continue with programs as we have already now every two years to have this. And then, of course, there's a huge amount of publications that have come out. Uh, also published in a variety in several by bibliographies, bringing together information about stigma. The third area has been complementing postgraduate education in psychiatry. Uh, and one thing that I thought was very important was specifically to focus our work on providing uh, communication and, uh, uh, skills and leadership skills to young psychiatrists. And in order to do this, we have courses which usually last a short time, they're very intensive, 10 to 12 hours a day. And these courses uh, serve to teach people very elementary educational and, um, leadership skills and uh, skills of communication with others. Uh, we've now held some 200 of those courses and altogether there are about 2,500 psychiatrists who've been trained. These are courses which never have more than 10 to 15 people and they are very uh, much oriented to daily practice, to things that people learn when they are 40, but could have, somebody could have told them when they have been uh, 25. And I think that that's been a very pop become a very popular course. We have also been working with the uh, various agencies that deal with undergraduate and postgraduate education, most recently with the programs that have been uh, developed for postgraduate education in Asia. Uh, so I think that these are the three main activities which uh, our association has been doing. We are trying to cope or help to cope with the comorbidity of mental and physical illness, reducing the stigma of mental illness, and complementing postgraduate education in psychiatry. I think that it is fair to say that uh, tasks of psychiatry now have grown in both numbers and type. They have not been diminished by societal progress nor by economic wealth that has been created. I think that the, the uh, traditional tasks of psychiatry, like treatment of mental disorder, etc., we know how to do them. We need much more resources to do them well, because we cannot do it otherwise. Otherwise, if there is not enough money and not enough uh, support, uh, a variety of untoward things will happen. Human rights will not be respected of the mental ill, there will be also treatment which will be substandard. So more investment will be necessary there. But it's also important and urgent to respond to new tasks of psychiatry. And I mentioned the prevention of mental disorders, the creation of a new cadre of psychiatrists with leadership and professional skills, of thinking about stigma in a different way, and uh, also facing comorbidity. And I think that uh, our association is trying to, <coughs> to deal with this, making a contribution <coughs> to uh, the resolution of these problems. And I hope that uh, there will be opportunities to report to you again about progress and that you might wish to join some of the work that we are doing. Thank you very much for your attention.